see so many experts in the room, so I hope I don't bore you too much, because it will be a very uh, simple and general introduction. I cannot touch too much in this uh, short time. So now let's see. Okay, when I think I stay better in this corner. When you do plasma spectroscopy, you have to think about the goals. And you know, you have one goal could be you like to determine, hold on. No, I'm sorry. You know, I have to learn. Huh. Oh, okay. Uh, I wanted to, to yes, but I have to return. No. Okay, sorry. You want to study radiative properties or you do spectroscopy because you want to study collisional properties, you can do it. You uh, want to study atoms in plasma environment, influence on the atomic structure by electric and magnetic fields. And you want to test theoretical calculations and the modeling uh, we will hear a lot uh, about it this week. Then you have the other area. You want to use plasmas as radiation sources, so you have to characterize your radiation source. Or you do plasma diagnostics uh, for determining plasma parameters. Now, depending upon your task, you have to select the plasma and you have to select the diagnostic equipment, which usually is not the case. You have to take uh, what is around in the lab. But so how, what is uh, radiation? How does the radiation from a plasma look like? Well, I took an example here, the radiation from a hydrogen plasma of about 170 EV. And you have the first the continuum radiation. Then you have the recombination radiation, when an electron recombines with an ion. You get the characteristic structure here with the edges, and you have the line radiation. If you go to long wavelengths and your plasma becomes larger and higher densities, it becomes optically thick, and here it, the Bremsstrahlung approaches first the black body limit. You cannot get out more of the plasma than the black body limit. So, but what can you do if you want optically thick radiation? You have to increase the density and the temperature, then this point moves up. But it is difficult to get optically thick radiation, so the maximum out of a plasma, by Bremsstrahlung. But you can do it with line radiation. You put in more and more atomic species, and they grow and finally can reach the black body limit, and you have a black body radiator at one specific wavelength. So, the task here deter uh, uh, determines the choice of your spectroscopic equipment. But you should roughly know the temperature. If you want uh, to do X-ray spectroscopy, you cannot use a 1 EV plasma because there won't be any radiation in that regime. So a rough knowledge of the temperature is helpful. Now, what do you measure? When you have a plasma and you do spectroscopy, you measure only the radiation which comes out. And this radiation is, de yeah, uh, is, gives you the information inside the plasma. This radiation is called the spectral radiance. And nothing else what you can get is from plasma spectroscopy. But what you really want is uh, the radiation 
from inside the plasma, and the radiate radiance, spectral radiance, is the integral along the line of sight of the local emission. And uh, now, but this doesn't help you very much. Only this is important if you do, if you want to use a source as a radiation source. But if you want to study properties inside the plasma, what can you do? You do observation at various directions from all directions. And you know it uh, from the medical uh, society people that you can do computer tomography. And from the computer tomography, you get the local information. But if you know the plasma, you know your plasma machines, it's just not possible to do observation from many sites. So how does one help? Well, there are exceptions. One is uh, if you have a cylindrical symmetric plasma, because then you integrate along chords. You know, the integration gives you here this radiance, and you do the able inversion, and you get local emission coefficients. Equivalent to this is the configuration with a pinhole here, because you can easily transform this to a cylindrical symmetry. You also can do it in tokamaks when you have a cylindrical uh, uh, plasma where the circles of equal densities are shifted by the Chevronov shift. You can take this into account. And you even can do it uh, in cases where you have an elliptical cross section. Another point people do mistakes is when you have small devices and do have a thick wall. What happens in a thick wall here, you know, this would be the radiance here without the wall. Now you take a thick wall, but luckily if you follow up the chords, you see you get the same radiance as if this were sim singular, only, of course, you co the chords are from another direction, but they are identical. So you get correct results. Then comes the problem. Your radiation from the plasma has goes through the air, and air absorbs. We show to the next uh, picture here, you see air absorbs here below 200 nanometers. So no spectroscopy in air below 200 nanometers. Again, in the X-ray region here, below 0.2 nanometers, or below, below 2, 3 angstroms, where you can do X-ray spectroscopy. How can you help yourself? Now you don't have the right equipment, which would be vacuum instruments for your spectrograph. You can fill the path from the plasma and the spectrograph. You can fill it with helium. And you see with helium here, you can go really further down. And you have only a, a smaller region where you can uh, not use uh, vacuum, uh, vacuum UV equipment. And you can also fill it with argon, OK? So here they are the examples for standard pressure and room temperature. But you have windows. So you know below the quartz window at 200 nanometers, nothing is possible through uh, quartz. But you could use sapphire. And for the one interesting thing is if you do infrared spectroscopy, you can go to about 10,000. Uh, here, 
have longer wavelengths for 10 millimeter uh, salt or calcium fluoride, noise lower. So in the lower region, one uses beryllium foils here. They transmit as windows. They transmit here at, uh, in this region here, you have beryllium, lexan, and captain. These are foils. You have to consider that, but it can help you doing uh, covering the spectral region. OK, now people use mirrors in spectrographs. And you won't believe it, but there are publications in a very excellent journals. They used a spectrograph in normal incidence below uh, 100, at below 10 nanometers, which is complete nonsense because no mirror reflects. Uh, there have been publications on that. So, here, you see the reflectivity of mirror, and you see going below uh, 100 nanometers, you can use gold and uh, osmium and platinum are also possible here. But you have to consider that when you use a spectrograph, what does the mirrors do? or if you do an optics with mirrors. But you can help yourself a little bit uh, by going to grazing incidence instruments because the reflectivity goes up when you have a radiation hitting at a small angle or a large angle of incidence or small incidence angle hitting the mirror. And uh, though the grazing incidence equipment can be used much lower. Well, I come to this equipment in a moment. So you have to select your instrument according to your, your task and what you want to do. And now are some design considerations. If you want to do survey spectra, a low instrument, uh, resolution instrument uh, is needed. If you want to total line intensities, then medium spectral resolution is uh, recommended. And if you want to study line profiles, you need high resolution instruments. And another thing is, in many plasmas, you don't have enough light so you want to collect as much light as possible. And so you need instruments with a high throughput. And uh, throughput or is called also étendu. And this means high large entrance slit times solid angle, which is recepted by the internal optics. Now, you have to look at the spectral region. When you have a plasma and think we add, inject atoms, then the atoms are being ionized. And if the temperature is high, or a temperature is given, the ions go successively through the ionization stages here. And, um, you see, we start one ion stage after the other till they come to an equilibrium. And the equilibrium is reached when recombination is equal to ionization. And uh, then you have a steady state situation. And in low, at low densities, this equilibrium is reached in the corona equilibrium. Ionization is balanced by radiative recombination. Or at high densities, you have a collisional equilibrium, you have the Saha equilibrium. So when you reach a steady state, I show you an example of for neon. Here, you see the steady state situation 
for neon is given here as a function of temperature. So, for example, if we have 100 EV neon plasma, you see the ions are mostly in the helium-like stage neon 9. Yeah, and they stay a long time in this ionization stage till they are then fu fully ionized at very high temperatures <coughs> of uh, 1,000 EV. But I will come to this later again. When you know the an ionization, lines from an ionization stage in a plasma, you can roughly estimate you know the temperature. <clears throat> so once you have uh, know roughly the temperature and you have selected your spectral region, uh, you can uh, go ahead and uh, have another consideration. You have to do, <coughs> do you want a stigmatic system or an asthmatic system? Now, I try to explain this here. <coughs> you have an entrance slit, you have a dispersing element in the spectrograph, and you know this point is imaged here. Another point here would be imaged up here. And you see <coughs> the entrance slit gives an image in the exit plane, and in this direction you have the wavelength scale. So <coughs> you can get the spectrum from an image in the plasma if you image your plasma on this lid. Now, <coughs> once you have selected that, what you want, we go to the types of spectrograph, which is very standard and you've found in, any, in every book. You know, the simplest one was this prism spectrograph. And uh, here, now, if I look at such a picture, you know, and you would draw it, I would immediately see if the guy who has done the drawing knows optics. Because in some books, and even textbooks, I have seen that these lens are the other way around. The curvature is in this side, and here also on that side. And this is very bad from an optical optics point of view. So you immediately can see if you build such an instrument if you thought about the optics of a lens. Okay, it, it's wrong in many general textbooks. Now here you can use half of a prism, but uh, they are not used very much anymore. But you can build it yourself very cheaply. Then you have the gratings, and you know everybody knows a reflection grating. I think I continue here. And then you design your instrument. And uh, the most commonly used instrument is of we call, it's called the Cherny Turner Mount. And uh, here it has good optical qualities with two mirrors and a plain grating. But now we are going to use this at lower wavelengths. Well, we have done it by filling in uh, helium. But something happens. This has three reflecting surfaces. And the reflection goes down of all three surfaces. So you can imagine if it's 50% reflectivity to the third power, how far the reflective the throughput has gone down. So then one uses this type of grating, which has a concave grating. And the grating is mounted on the Rowland circle. Now you have only one reflective surface. Okay, So this helps quite a bit. And you should consider it uh, when you have a chance to select what you need. Now, what I said, if the reflectivity goes down too much, 
as a rule of thumb, I always thought 300, um, uh, uh, 30 nanometers below that, you never can use this kind of instruments, normal instruments. Then you should go to the grazing incidence instrument. And the grazing incidence instrument uh, here has also a curved grating sitting on the Rowland circle at a very narrow angle of incidence, uh, a, a very large angle of incidence, a small angle of grazing incidence. And it's focused on the Rowland circle. So you need, for this kind of instruments, you need a detector with a flat with a curved <coughs> detection plane. <coughs> a very simple design and a cheap design is the so-called off Rowland design. You just put a plane detector here. You see, it's focused at one point, and it is not focused a little off the good focusing point. But <coughs> you can live with it. If you do the mount right, and you cannot do for all constructions, but in certain cases, you can do it. And these instruments are very cheap, and they are on the market, too. So with a grazing incident instrument, people have gone down to 0.54 nanometers for a grazing incidence angle of two angstrom. If you go further down, you, of course, limit your throughput, your angle of your acceptance angle of the instrument. And the problem is a grazing incidence instrument requires great care in alignment. So, but development has not stopped, and the development was with the detectors. And at first, uh, with uh, the uh, uh, grating, one does not use a grating with equal spacing. One uses a grating with uh, changing spacing. And they have the uh, characteristic that the plane of focusing is a plane okay, with varied line space. And so it's easier uh, to align. Or, you know, it's most commonly used now. Uh, but at disadvantage, the grading incidence instruments are astigmatic. So if you have a system where you want to have a stigmatic image, people have done this also. They have used various mirrors, toroidal mirrors, to re-image two or three times the image to get a stigmatic image. Now, what also have been used are toroidal gratings. They give two-dimensional focusing and uh, minimize the aberrations. But you just have to look at the literature, what is available. Now, to very short wavelengths, <coughs> you go to crystals. And crystals, uh, I just mentioned, you know, you have reflection by the back angle. But when you design your instruments, you have to be aware of the following. If you have a point source, you know, each wavelength is reflected at a different angle and from a different point on the crystal. So this is different from mirror instruments, where one wavelength is by focusing from the whole area. Here, <coughs> one wavelength in one direction is uh, from focusing here on one point. So what you have from a point source are cones coming like that. And you know this in all directions. 
<coughs> and what one cut does, one cuts out here a small piece, so reflection comes from this area, and here are the lines. And depending how you set up your instruments, these lines are parts of a hyperbola, an ellipse, or a parabola, when you cut a cone with a plane, you know, from focus. Now, the focusing properties are then similar to that of uh, a grating. And I show you one typical mount, which is used in large devices. Here, you see this point on the Rowland circle is focused, uh, focuses onto here. OK. And, uh, this point, this line, is focused here from different points, different wavelengths. And so the radiation collected is from a large plasma volume. It's not from a point source. So this you have to be aware if you do use this uh, alignment in, uh, for large, focus, uh, large plasma devices like Tokomax. And uh, it has advantages, of course, because, you know, if in Tokamak you have rotation, both lines have, diff have different Doppler shifts. And so you can measure the Doppler shift from the line, just to, to mention it. OK, you can also use another property of crystals. Crystals can polarize. So, you can study the polarization if you use a crystal, the reflection at the Brewster angle, which has been done also in the literature. So it's possible with crystals, this, this kind of measurement. Another commonly used uh, spectrograph is the Van Hemos mount. And uh, you see here, it's a cylindrical crystals and it's focused along the axis of the crystal mount. So you can have a plane detector here. And uh, there are also now two uh, cylindrically curved crystals, oh, excuse me, spherical curved crystals. So you can also do uh, imaging. So there is uh, more in the literature than I can mention here at the moment. So the next point I want to mention are the detectors. And there are many possible possibilities. And they also depend upon what you want to do and what you want to observe. And uh, what a detector does it converts a flux into a signal. And so the spectral sensitivity is usually what characterizes the detector in respect to your applications. Now, what uh, it does, you know, you have uh, to also think if you want to integrate or you want a time resolve spectrum. So one has, and you then you have, a, a st besides a steady state, you have slow varying plasmas, and you have fast varying plasmas, where you want detection in the, in the picosecond range. So this gives you a device. And so the general formula is the time response, if I call it T, and the frequency bandwidth of the response are given by this simple relation down at the bottom. Now another point is you have to look at the dark signal due to dark currents, because this can destroy when you have very weak radiation. And then you have, usually, you. You help yourself by cooling the detector to 
down, then the noise, which is usually thermal noise, shot noise, can be reduced. Another point is thing, and these are mystics. Each, all detect or most detectors have an internal time delay, and people correlate signals and forget the time delay. And uh, this is very important because, and there are wrong things in the literature too that uh, there were conclusions, but it was just a time delay by different detectors. So you have to know the internal time delay. Time delay of cables is of, is trivial, but also there people have bad mistakes by using different cables and neglecting the time in a cable for short time detections. Then you have to look at the linearity. It's called the dynamic range of the detectors. And you have to look at the long time stability. Some very sensitive detectors age rather quickly. And you know, if you have things in the lab for some time it's not used, suddenly it doesn't work properly anymore. Then you have area detectors like uh, the charge CCDs, and uh, with uh, CCDs, they give you, uh, at the exit side, you know, you, from a point, you get a two-dimensional image. And here, you have to look the, at the pixel size, because it determines the spectral resolution. And from a point on the entrance of the detector, you get on the output not a point, but the point spread function, which you have to identify for your analysis. Then important are gate times. If you have, want to, to look at specific times and the development, or if you want to take frames, the frame number of frames and the repetition of frames is an important point to consider. Another uh, device which is not so used, not so often used anymore, but was commonly used are the photomultipliers. And uh, here, you have your know, photons are converted to electrons. They are multiplied at the dynodes. And at the anode, you get the signal. What you have to watch with photomultipliers, if the incident flux is too large, you get too many electrons. And you get space charge effects here. And some of these effects uh, show up that suddenly uh, the signal gets less, and then it gets much larger. So are funny effects. So, and uh, also, the current, the anode current should not be too large. And uh, this gives also uh, various problems. And um, one tries to help itself, you know, you have in the photomultiplier to the dyno change, you supply the voltage by a resistor chain. And if the amplification is too large, the dyno cannot deliver the electrons anymore. So the amplification goes down. One can help this for a short time by putting in parallel to the resistor chain capacitors. So for short pulses, these capacitors supply the electrons and keep the voltage constant. In the other case, the voltage would drop and the amplification goes down, and you get wrong results. So if you use a photomultiplier, please look at the specifications not only of the photomultiplier, but also of the internal construction, the dyno chain, 
with the capacitors. Okay, and then another point asks if you go to the vacuum UV and the uh, X-ray region, you can use uh, scintillators in front of the photomultiplier. And these scintillators, of course, have also time constants. You have to look at, you know, they are nice scintillators with high efficiency. They have uh, relatively long decay times. And one can do the following. One um, add to the scintillators other elements, which cut down the tracer elements, which cut down the time constant, but cut down even more uh, the sensitivity. Now, other photomultipliers are the channel photomultiplier or channel tron. Here, you have a continuous diode. And this is all a, a, a dynode. And this, then you have a continuous voltage along here. The dynode internally is also the voltage divider. Now, if you put many of these small channel trends together, you know, you have the micro channel plates here, many micro channel plates. They are accelerated and finally hit uh, the electrons, hits a fourth four. Okay, you can also gate. Now, uh, photodiodes you have uh, a, a large number available, uh, even in the X ray region. You have many two dimensional uh, CCDs available. You can use ionization chambers. Uh, you also, people use multi-wire proportional counters for the X-rays, of course, also for other particles. They are usually used in fusion devices. And here, you, you can have them two-dimensional. You have a photon You're hitting the cathode, it makes an avalanche. And when the avalanche reads the anode, you measure the arrival time on both ends. And you know at what positions. You do it two-dimensionally. You know, part of it goes through. And you hit also the bottom one. And you get also a coding in this direction. And you know exactly where the photon hits. Uh, very new development, uh, which is now continuously uh, more and more investigated in supply, are the gas electron, electron multipliers. So what you do is you have in a foil, you have this double cone little holes, and uh, electrons, here is a, you can have a high electric field in this electron multiplier. And uh, you can have all the spatial resolution. And they have the advantage, they are relatively cheap, have an amplification of 1,000. They are very robust against damage. And you have two-dimensional arrangement. And you have, if you can put two together, you get a very large uh, amplification. OK, then comes the main point, is the calibration. And uh, really, don't trust an instrument which you get delivered by a manufacturer. They say it's aligned, but if they don't align it and calibrate it in your lab, you can forget about it. I always like to tell a story. I made a student, and she had done many, many measurements. And uh, the temperature was an argon discharge thousands of elements analyzed 
and she obtained a temperature, which sounded reasonable. And she asked me, and I tried to analyze the spectrum. I couldn't fit the spectrum. There was no strong lines. So then I thought there must be strong lines. And by doing by hand shifting the spectrum around, I found she was AD angstrom off. So she had all lines were off by AD angstrom. It was a low resolution instrument. So in a kind, a kind of argon plasma, so have, you have so many lines that you always believe you are right. So I asked, how did you do the calibration? Oh, I got it from the factory. Well, that's it. You have to do the first your calibration yourself with uh, a line. And at first, the wavelength calibration. You must be sure you are measuring the right quantities. OK, now you see you have various uh, reasons. You have uh, UV if you want to calibration in wavelengths in the visible. In the X-ray region, you have to use discharges uh, which emits a proper radiation. You have, but wavelength calibration is simple. Uh, the sensitivity calibration is more difficult. And you have primary standards, and you have secondary standards. And the best standard is, of course, a black body radiator. And I know that the astronomers who do visible spectroscopy, they also use, they build their own black body radiator with an oven, and they heat it to a definite temperature and have a small hole. The black body radiation emanates. So this is given, the whole realm radiation is given by Planck's radiation law. Oh, excuse me, maybe. OK, for the X-ray radi uh, radiation, electron storage rings are the radiatic radiometric standard source. But they are difficult. And the disadvantage is that uh, they use elect the electron storage rings emit only in a, in a small angle in one direction. And you really would like to have a radiator a standard which emits into a large angle, and hopefully also from a larger size. Now, when you don't have the possibility of the X-ray calibration, you cannot easily take your, your big spectrograph and go to an institute like NIST or another standard institute. It's nearly a PhD thesis to do a calibration on these devices. And uh, how can you help yourself? And one possibility is the branching ratio method. Here you take, you put an ion in, you, in one plasma. Even that, what you want to study. And you take two lines. One is in the long wave region, and one is in the short wavelength. And, and, excuse me, in the, this line is in the long wave, short wavelength region, and this line is in the long wavelength region. And you compare the radians, and it depends only on the ratio of the transition probability. So you look at, take a pair, one line is in, let's say, in the visible, where you can do easily the calibration, and automatically you have the calibration in the UV, extreme UV. And you can do it with, there are enough possibilities and enough very good transition probabilities available. Oh, and then you have to watch, you know, when you do the experiments, what uh, can happen. Spectrograph can have varying intensity across the slit height. Because, you know, from the center of the slit and from a, a long slit, it can be reflection and have a different throughput, different cone inside the instrument. So you must calibrate this. You must calibrate the pixels 
you cannot assume if you have a CC detector all the pixels have equal sensitivity. So you calibrate this effect, which is called flat feeling. Then a fast detectors uh, see the irising effect. When you put a pulse to a camera, it takes a finite time to pass through the detector, to open the detector for gating. So it's, you have to take into account that you may get wrong results. OK, but you are, have many secondary standards. OK, tungsten strip lamp, blue carbon arc, wall stabilized arcs, hollow cathode discharges. In the X-ray region, no sec I don't know of any stan secondary standard. Some people have built themselves an own standard at home, maybe. OK, and most of all the material is from that book. Okay, thank you for your attention.